and because I'm sure you guys will have tons of questions. So if you just kind of want to jot them down as, as we go along, sure. uh, and then we can revisit them uh, on an individual basis, that'll probably work the best. Great. And I would recommend writing them down because a lot of the information is a little bit dense, so there may be a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Before you go further, could you go back one slide so I can sure. jot my question down? Let me say possible. Yep. This one? Yeah. Are you looking for the Bridgeport schools or in blue? I'm looking at the whole thing. Oh, the whole thing? Slide. Okay. So we will have this online, so uh, we can definitely send this to you. And, and just to, to explain a little bit more about how these schools were selected. So, when we assemble our school report cards, Khan Cam gives a report card to every school in the state of Connecticut, over a thousand schools. We look at the schools that have a combined student population that's at least 75% low income and minority. So if their percentage of low-income students and their percentage of minority students adds up to 75, we, we pull all those schools into a group, and we look at those schools that have these concentrations of uh, students of color and students in poverty, and we look to see which ones are the highest performing. And so we, we um, award what we call our Success Story School Award to these schools that have these uh, high, low-income, and minority populations that actually have those groups of students outperforming the state average. So a few slides back, we saw that the state average for elementary schools was 66% of students at or above goal. Students in these elementary schools, low-income students and students of color, are beating that percentage. So there are, are schools in Connecticut that are showing that just because students are in poverty or they are minority students doesn't mean that they have to be performing under the state average. So these are examples of what's possible in Connecticut, and but at the same time, this is, this is the list. This is it. These are the only schools in Connecticut. If you're attending a school that's got a lot of students in poverty or a lot of students of color, these are the only schools that you can attend where you've, you've got a pretty solid chance that your, your student is going to be uh, performing at or above the state average. So the, and, and the most shocking thing on there, there's one high school. There's one high school that has a high, low income and minority population that beats the state average. And as you'll notice, it's not, it's not in Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. As a parent and an activist for like 15 years, an observation I see there is, and I know, um, all of them are magnet schools mm -hmm. in Bridgeport. Mm -hmm. And Black Rock is in the North End, mm -hmm. where it's very influential and high income families. So you see the rich and you see the magnet there. Can I make a correction though? I think that uh, Black Rock actually is a lot more diverse than people think. I think if we look at uh, district demographics, about 75% of the children attending Black Rock School are actually Hispanic. Right, but the location is what I'm talking about. It's in the North End. Or you mean Black Rock, yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. The location. And the students that are there that are not color, their parents are very strong in that school. Oh, so That's you're saying, saying that the, the community of parents yes, is the community, strong. Even though they're less, right. the community itself is loud. Mm -hmm. Right. Get it? So, or just thing, parental involvement is high, I guess is what you're yeah. Parental and parent uh, vocally, you know, yeah. uh, making sure that school is rock solid. Yeah. So, so there's a difference. Yeah. All these schools have found a way, and they're, they're doing know, something that I, other schools aren't doing. Schools. And so that kind of brings us to the, the governor's bill and what's in it, because I think a lot of what's in the bill is trying to replicate what these schools are doing in other areas of Connecticut. So. Uh, Without further ado, yes. let's uh, let's move in and take a look at what's in the governor's bill. So the name of the, the governor's bill, if you want to look it up online, it's Senate Bill 24, uh, and it's titled An Act Concerning Educational Competitiveness. And so if we look at start looking at the highlights, one thing it does right away is it implements a new way to hold schools and districts accountable. Um, up until now, we've been holding schools and districts accountable under the No Child Left Behind Act with what's called Annual Yearly Performance or Progress, AYP. And I'm sure all of you have heard that acronym before. Um, now, AYP is pretty much getting thrown out the window because uh, the president is allowing states to apply for waivers if they implement a different system. So part of the governor's bill establishes a new system for uh, grading school and district performance. The old system just looked at the percentage of students at or above the proficient level on the CMT and CAP tests to grade the whole school. What is in the governor's bill is a measure that would take a look at the students in every performance category. So looking at how many students do you have below basic, 
how many students are at basic, proficient, goal, and advanced. And using a combination of those numbers, figuring out kind of a, a more robust look at where students actually are in the school rather than just one number, are you above or below this line? So it's a little bit more of a holistic view of, of uh, student performance. Another reason the, the state is implementing this is there's some new powers in here that will allow the Commissioner of Education, uh, his name is Stephen Pryor, to establish what's uh, being called the Commissioner's Network of Schools, where the State Department of Education would essentially take control of operation of up to 25 of the lowest performing schools in Connecticut. Now, it hasn't been determined which 25 schools they will be. Um, it, it probably won't be 25 right in year one. It's over a two-year period. They're allowed to take over 25 schools total under this bill. Um, and so that being said, there's a chance that one of those 25, if not more, may, may or may not be from Bridgeport. So that's something that some of you uh, may want to, to pay attention to. Um, a few other things it does, teacher tenure is overhauled in this bill so that instead of it being the current standard right now where you have to teach for four years in a classroom and then you're granted tenure, it makes the awarding of tenure contingent upon the performance of that teacher in the classroom. And I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit more detail um, because the state is also overhauling the evaluation process for both principals and for teachers. So evaluations that were just they, uh, just stepping back a little bit more, there was a council formed uh, in a bill for the Race to the Top Act that was going to establish a new framework for teacher evaluation all across the state. So it brought together uh, the principals, superintendents, teachers unions, um, all, all the traditional stakeholders have been sitting down and kind of working at these guidelines. And just last week, the State Board of Education approved a new framework that will leave... Uh, or that will create a evaluation system for teachers or a standard statewide that will include up to 45% of that evaluation for teachers and principals um, based on student performance. So if a teacher is helping kids grow in the classroom, they're going to have a higher evaluation rating. Also included in the rating is 40% uh, classroom observations, 10% um, parent and peer feedback, so those could be through parent surveys or surveys of fellow teachers that hasn't been worked out yet. And, and then 5% of a school-wide uh, performance measure as well. So there's, a, and this was agreed to by all the parties that were on board. So the superintendents, the teachers unions, everybody was in agreement with these guidelines. And they were just adopted by the state board. So now, with those guidelines in place, we're going to have a new system of teacher evaluation in Connecticut. And if this bill were to be passed, Teachers would earn their tenure by getting evaluations that are in the top two categories out of four. So it, there would be four ratings, needs improvement, developing, proficient, and exemplary. If you get those top two ratings, you could earn tenure as early as three years into your teaching career or as late as five years, depending on how high you rate it on those tests. But it, it's very different than the current structure where all it takes is, is staying in the classroom for four years. So it, it really changes how tenure is awarded to teachers. Um, another big thing in this bill is additional funding uh, that's being implemented. Um, now, in the bill it says that it's going to ECS, but the, the vast majority of the funding increase, out of the $50 million, 39 and a half are going to conditional funding districts. And what that means is these are 30 of the lowest performing and highest needs districts in Connecticut. And they call it conditional funding because in order for these districts to get that funding, they're going to have to present the State Department of Education with a plan that outlines how they're going to adopt certain reforms. So that could be new ways of rewarding excellent teaching. It could mean um, showing improved coordination with wraparound services and other services for students that are, are, are non-academic. It could mean... Um, waiting funding within a district uh, for different student needs. There, there's a whole list of, of different ways that districts can apply for this funding, but the most important part is that they have to show the district what their plan is for this additional um, money. Like, it, they're not just going to get you know, $5 million in new funding. The, the State Department of Education will say, well, what are you going to do with it to boost student achievement? So districts are in these 30 districts, of which Bridgeport is one, 
they're going to have to come up with a plan for how they're going to take that funding 